It's time for the Douglas Coleman Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From the entertainment industry to authors to political and social commentators. The famous and not so famous. The controversial and the light and fluffy. We have it all. Now, here's Douglas Coleman. Okay, please welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show, Livingston Taylor. Hello, Livingston. Douglas, how are you? Thank you so much for taking time to talk to me today. Oh, well, the pleasure is mine. Thank you for coming on the show. You've got a long career that we can talk about, but I did want to ask you one thing right off the bat that's always been curious yeah. for me. I know somewhat of the history of your family uh, uh -huh. and how everyone is pretty much musical. All of your siblings and everybody sort of went in different directions musically, although you guys have worked together off and on t from time to time. Yeah. When you guys were kids, did you ever think, like, we're going to form a sibling group like the Beach Boys or the Bee Gees? I mean, did that ever occur to you guys, or did you just all decide to go off in different directions musically? I don't think that there was particular... Uh, a parental support or encouragement for us to sort of bond together and do uh, uh, and and make music. Clearly, this would have been something that, in the formative stages of the Bee Gees or the Beach Boys or the Osman family or the Jackson Five, right. mm -hmm. there would have been a strong uh, a parental or elder force. Uh, pushing in that direction, and uh, my father was a a doctor, uh, was dean of the medical school at the University of North Carolina. My mother had five kids to take care of. the The notion that that they would have extra time in those days to put together a music review of their children just it just wasn't on the radar screen. So no, we didn't do it per se. Okay, but everybody pursued their own musical careers sort of individually. Well, I think that we do pursue musical careers, but um, we also do other things well. Certainly, um, my brother James, for example, is obviously a wonderful guitar player, a very fine singer, and a very fine songwriter, but also he's a terrific entertainer um he does a terrific extemporaneous speech if need be uh my sister kate is a wonderful guitar player and singer and songwriter but she's also a jewelry designer she uh so there there are lots of interests that come along with it and and the sense, Douglas, is that all of these things are heaped together. Um, um, that you're a singer, songwriter, uh, means that you can also be a good performer. It's, it's, it ain't necessarily so. Okay, I know we talked a little bit about this before we got on, but I wanted to bring this up again. You are a professor at Berklee School of Music in Boston and have been for a number of years. And I know you said that you have scaled back a little bit, but you're still sort of technically there. Um, you teach a class called Stage Performance. And we were talking about that it's, it's almost kind of like marketing and selling yourself. But why don't you explain a little bit about what that course is all about? Oh, it's a great course. How do you market it? How do you sell it? Why should people buy this? Why should people come to suspend their reality, enter your reality, and then receive enough of value that they'd be willing to re-enter and pay to do so. Okay, so it's really about marketing yourself as a, as a product, as a package? Well, it's funny you should say, uh, it, it sounds like, uh, it sounds like head and shoulder shampoo. Kind it of, sounds yeah. like Procter Gamble when you, when you put it in that context, because it's not that context. It's the context of people, your audience receiving value, your audience 
feeling better about themselves when your show is over than they felt when your show began. Um, you have to give, you're, you're not just selling something, you're making people feel better about themselves, and as a result, they're willing to support you. That's all. Can you give me an example of how one would do that? Oh, absolutely. You ready? I'm ready. So, what I would do is I walk on stage, and first off, when I walk on stage, I'm completely situationally aware. The person that has brought me on stage, um, you know, let's say it was you introducing me, and uh, this is Douglas Coleman, and I, uh, uh, I'm delighted to be your MC tonight. Please welcome to our stage Livingston Taylor. And I'm walking on from stage right behind the curtain. And I'm walking to that center microphone, and you're walking back towards me. And I would stop. I would stop you. And I would look you right in the eye. And before I engaged that audience, I would look at you, and I would say to you, um, Douglas, Thank you for that beautiful introduction. So glad to be here. So glad to see you. So we would have that. Now the audience is watching me do that. They don't know what I'm saying, but they are watching me be attentive and gracious to you, the person who brought me on. And now they know that I will treat them the same way. And so um, uh, I then I would leave you, having greeted you with my complete attention, and now my complete attention goes to the audience. And before I ever go on mic, I stand slightly stage right, simply look at them with my hands at my side, and a huge, broad smile across my face. And what it's the message that it is sending them is, I am so happy to be in your presence right now. I've never felt happier. I, you have given me complete joy by your presence. You had to do nothing. Simply being here was enough. Wow. And so now an audience before I sung a friggin' no is feeling great about themselves. Wow. Then the show begins. So somebody like Miles. So that's what I. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, somebody I, like Miles Davis. Somebody like Miles Davis who, who often would just stand with his back to the audience. Would you, would you not recommend that approach at this point? Uh, Miles Davis was an idiot. While he was working funky little clubs, right, making uh, making pennies a night, uh, Louis Armstrong was working in movies and selling out multi-thousand seat concert halls. You tell me which career you'd rather uh, have. I can tell you. I want Louis Armstrong's career, not Miles Davis's. I'm not speaking about talent here. I'm speaking about uh, developing and caring for an audience. Uh, this is a real good segue to kind of go into the music industry, generally speaking. Um, and I'd like yes. to bring this up, particularly with people like you who are veterans of the industry, who have been in the business for a long time because you've seen the whole transition from the way it was in the 60s with record albums to cassettes yeah. to CD and now to digital and streaming uh, and DIY. Yeah. Musicians that are coming up, aspiring musicians now, basically have to do everything themselves. It's a complete DIY environment with the social media, with the uploading, with home recording has been made very simple and cheap. So you really have to be your own marketing, your own PR, as well as your own performer, your own writer. You have to do everything. So yes, some 
musicians that I've known, and I'm a musician myself, are not great at the business side. We don't have that kind of innate ability to disconnect from our product, our passion, and treat it like a commodity for sale on the internet. And in the days before all of this, musicians had managers who would take care of all of that. And you could concentrate on your craft and on your skills as a musician. Now you've kind of got to do everything. Do you think that's good? Or do you think it's bad? Or what do you think of the overall industry these days? Because it's a completely new industry. Great art is the result of wealth concentrating talent. The great difficulty with the internet is that the internet eviscerated. It took over and gave away for free all the revenue streams that the record companies had enjoyed. And what that eviscerated first in the music industry, but in every other industry, publishing, newspapers, magazines, everything was eviscerated by the same forces, and it eliminated gatekeepers. Yes. It didn't eliminate creativity. It eliminated the gatekeepers that uh, arbitrated the creativity, and that's where the nightmare comes in. So essentially, it's the double-edged sword of anybody can put their music out on the Internet, is the good news and the bad news at the same time. Yes, and clearly, given the chaos of the day, it's clearly worse news than uh, the news is, <laughs> is bad, not good. The assumption was that a wide-open Internet would allow all that previous, previously unrecognized talent to emerge Nothing could be further from the truth. Um, uh, it, it, what it means is that anybody has uh, access, and that means everybody has access, and all is chaos. So the other problem with the Internet and technology, more specifically, that I see yeah. infiltrating into the music is the actual creation of the music. Like, I, I really do like digital manipulation for editing, yeah. for mixing, for sure. mastering. It's mm. wonderful. Pro Tools is fabulous, okay? But what I have a problem with, at least intellectually, is when the computer is actually creating the noise that we're hearing. Yeah. And it's not Again, a human yeah. being. Yeah. I, I know, but Douglas, it's what you're having a problem with is not... Uh, a new sound, what you're having a problem is that it's a new sound that hasn't gone through the filter of reasonable gatekeepers. Again, what is happening is somebody's making stuff that already existed and manipulating that in the desperate hope that it will sound different enough because it can't sound better because it was assembled by such a stunning level of professionals, not only musicians and songwriters and singers, but album cover designers, studios, assistant engineers, all of the infrastructure that was afforded by wealth-concentrating talent. And so, um, and by the way, uh, when you speak about electronic manipulation, imagine an electric guitar coming in in the uh, 30s and 40s. That was electronics manipulating uh, vibrating strings. Well, that's so true. we've yeah. seen that electronic intrusion a lot of times. That's true. In fact, I saw a omnibus special with Les Paul trying to convince people that multi-tracking and overdubbing was not cheating. Uh, he was trying yeah. to explain that on so, television, yeah. So, so again, your complaint, is, it's got a little bit of old, not able to adapt, 
nothing personal. Don't worry, I'm in the same spot. <laughs> and and um, uh, and it also, what is really offending you is that there isn't a gatekeeper that you trust arbitrating it. Well, that's and saying true. To you, yeah. No, 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 Douglas, listen up. I'm telling you this is good. I haven't steered you wrong in the past, and I'm not steering you wrong now. And so there's, that's one of the problems. Gatekeepers are unbelievably important, and the Internet absolutely eviscerated all of them and left us in the chaos of nobody to edit. You're listening to Mr. Smooth and Savvy right here on The Douglas Coleman Show. We'll be right back after these commercial messages. Douglas Coleman's Don't Do a Podcast is a dryly humorous rant about Douglas's pet peeve, the unrelenting torrent of podcasts hitting the web on a constant basis. As technology has put podcasting within the reach of anyone, many wholly unqualified people have taken the plunge. This witty polemic tries to persuade them from broadcasting their drivel using Douglas's brand of sarcastic humor. Now on Amazon, only 99 cents. DJC Music and DJC Productions are pleased to announce a brand new website. We have started a listing website for radio show hosts as well as potential show guests. This is a meeting site where hosts and guests can come together. Show hosts can list their show and types of guests they're interested in booking. Potential guests can list their talents, bio, accomplishments or anything they feel makes them an interesting radio show guest. There are no recurrent payments, only a one-time $5 listing fee. Your listing will stay up until you decide to cancel. Previous guests of The Douglas Coleman Show are welcome to submit their guest listing free of charge. Go to radiohostsandguests.com. That's radiohostsandguests.com. Love coffee, huh? But wait a minute. It seems like every time you finish a cup of coffee, you get all of these side effects along with it. Heartburn, digestion, upset stomach, acid reflux. As the world's first and only organic acid-free coffee, Tyler's Coffee is able to provide a healthier option in the solution for more than 100 million individuals who have sensitive stomachs or suffer from acid-related modalities. This is Tyler's Acid-Free Coffee. Coffee without the consequences. Hi, this is John Morgan, Production Supervisor for DJC Productions. You're listening to The Douglas Coleman Show. The other problem yeah. that I have with the technological side, where everything can be done with MIDI, every single noise you hear can be done, can be replicated with the computer, is it's taken the soul out of the music. The only people that have soul in their sound is when it's a human voice or a human playing a guitar. But when I hear computer-generated sounds, the soul's gone. It's been removed, and it leaves me cold. It doesn't have the, the hairs on the back of my neck standing up when I hear a beautiful singer or a beautiful guitar player. It's gone. I, I know, but, but I would argue back to you that you always were, um, you never heard a human voice. All you heard was a human voice into a microphone that was turned into electrical signals that was then turned into alignment, uh, a magnetic alignment on a piece of tape somewhere, and then that process reversed to come back to you, uh, never mind that it went into the grooves of a record. So I hear what you're saying, but uh, what... I would argue back to you, your complaint is that the computer hasn't done it in a way yet that touches your soul. Yes, that's true. And the moment that computers can replicate human emotion, I think we're heading right down the matrix tube at that point. Well, we may be, we may not be. Uh, I don't know how old you are, but I can tell you that uh, I'm 70, 
And one of the things that I know for sure is that uh, the most eternal of human prediction is the prediction by older people that the world will go to hell when placed in the hands of younger people. <laughs> and it just hasn't happened yet. No, not yet. Not yet. They get to invent their own reality. They get to find their own world, Douglas. And, and they don't need our... Our ripple gets to the edge of the pond. They don't need our approval to find their own direction. What they need is our advocacy and our observation. And so, listen, I agree with you about the computer-generated voice. I can't bear it. But I'm not sure I will love it when they finally get it good enough that it fools me. Well, it's interesting to see because video deep fakes have fooled me. So the video side is, I think, just about there where they've manipulated somebody saying something that they never said. Uh, the the yeah. scary part for me with artificial intelligence is once the computer has an agenda, then it's going to yeah. get scary because right now it's benign. It doesn't have an agenda. It does what we tell it to do. Well, that's what uh, Google tells it to do, and that yeah. Google has an agenda. I'm using that as a broad <laughs> term, not Google specifically, but you know what No, I'm I know saying. what you mean. Yeah, well, it's, it's getting um, there. So I love the notion of the fear of artificial intelligence. First off, there's no such thing as intelligence, actually. What there is, is pattern recognition. If we were really intelligent, like cheaper Douglas, if we were really intelligent, we would have intergalactic travel, interdimensional travel, and we would be able to control gravity. The fact is that we live not because we're intelligent, but we're, uh, we have developed enough pattern recognition to be able to reproduce and live long enough that our children grow to maturity where they can reproduce. Um, if anybody could see vastly far into the future, it would be considered crazy and probably dangerous. They would either be put in jail, in an insane asylum, or killed outright. So the Wright brothers hadn't flown December 17th, 1903, somebody would have done it August 12th, 1905. If Einstein hadn't done special relativity uh, in uh, 1905, somebody would have done it in 1912. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Nobody is that far ahead. Nobody is that far away. Artificial intelligence, you're as bright as the dumbest person in your group. I assure you, Albert Einstein, in a room full of golden retriever puppies, is as bright as those golden retriever puppies. <laughs> and if the computers do take over, right, they will take over so fast and so quickly, you will not know what hit you. You will simply one instant be here, and the next instant you will be gone. Trust me, you won't see it coming, and it won't hurt. Well, as long as it doesn't hurt, then I think I'm okay <laughs> with it. Yeah. No, I am infinitely optimistic and enthusiastic about the future. Well, good. I'm, I'm glad to hear it. I think I'm uh, moderately pessimistic. I get that drift. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, again, this, this is what uh, audiences like to hear from me. It's why I do well, because I see an audience, and I look at them and I say, you are loved. I love you. The universe loves you. And whatever you're doing, keep doing it because it's working great. I got a couple of things on my sheet here that I wanted to hit yeah. to talk to you about. Uh, one was called This Week's Music. 
Do you remember that? Oh, my God, I remember it well, of course. Now, I never heard of it. When was it on? It was on, I had a 13-week run in in the fall of 1980, oh gosh, what year was it? 1980. 84, it says, yeah. Yes. And uh, maybe it was, oh, oh, it might have been 83 or 82. Anyhow, I was in my early 30s, and it was a uh, syndicated television show, much like the show Solid Gold. And uh, we had the This Week's Music Dancers, and we taped it in New York. And we were playing the uh, the newly burgeoning uh, uh, videos of the day. And uh, MTV had just started, and uh, it was sort of a take on those things. Okay, so it wasn't uh, live performing bands. You were playing the videos. Oh of no, the- no, we had we had oh we had bands come on. Bon Jovi was on, and Shaka Khan, oh, okay. and Billy Ocean, and oh yeah, yeah, we'd have bands, and a little bit like American Bandstand, sort of a hybrid of those. And it was on um, network television, or was it on cable? Oh, well, it was it was syndicated through Viacom, so it wasn't a network show. It was uh, locally purchased and uh, broadcast. Uh, the other thing on your bio that I found interesting is you are a pilot? Yes. I love to fly airplanes. And you, you still fly regularly, yeah? Oh, yes. I, I fly all the time. And by the way, not only do I fly, I hate money so much that I own an airplane. What kind of airplane do you have? I own a 1964 Cessna 205. 64 Cessna 205. Your listeners can look it up. It's a a single-engine, six-passenger, heavy hauler with fixed gear. And, uh, yep, I fly it around. I I fly about 150 hours a year, which is a fair amount and uh, love my little aeroplane. Do you use it to commute? Yes, I use it to commute from Martha's Vineyard to Boston, but I use it also when I go to work, when I do shows, see if I'm up in Maine or Pennsylvania, down to Washington. Uh, I use it to commute around the Northeast. Okay. Before we got on, you had mentioned something about a retrospective live. You want to tell us a bit about that? Yeah, I uh, because I been really known as uh, an enthusiastic live performer. Uh, I did a retrospective of, uh, of a bunch of songs from, uh, from my live shows, and uh, I put it into a large package, uh, and it's, it's called Live, L-I-V, and then a different colored E, Live Taylor, Live Live, yeah. Uh, with a play on that, and uh, uh, there's a a five box set which includes a lot of other things, a five CD box set, and then just a single CD uh, around that. And uh, had a wonderful time putting it together. I must say. Are you performing anywhere currently, or are you? What are you doing oh, yeah. these days? Oh, yeah, uh, I'm I'm busier than a Chinese chicken. I'm. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I have a schedule, and you can go to my uh, website, uh, livetaylor.com, and it tells you where I'm going to be playing and what I'm going to be doing, and uh, it's laid out there. Okay, great. Well, I think we've covered everything. Anything else you want to talk about before we wrap it up? Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. Uh, I've started a Patreon page where people can subscribe to Livingston Taylor. Uh, for a, a modest fee, you can do it as little as uh, uh, $5 a month. And you can come on Patreon, and I broadcast uh, a live show periodically. And you get information about different things. And it's it's just a way, again, in this Internet time where the music itself can generate no value. It's a way of uh, having people who uh, like how I think and behave, just a way of uh, uh, contributing 
to me, and not only to me, because uh, frankly I do fine, but to the office and the infrastructure that uh, exists that used to depend on things like record royalties, but those are all gone now. And so it's just a way of uh, keeping the, uh, uh, the office up and functional. Keeping the lights on, as it were, yeah? Yeah, basically, uh, you've got it. <laughs> All right, so Patreon.com. Right. Yes. And Livingston Taylor. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much oh, for coming on. Taylor. Oh, Douglas, it's been so nice to speak with you. And uh, um, be optimistic. We are viewed by very favorable stars. <laughs> and uh, be of good cheer. Thanks again for coming on. It was a pleasure speaking with you. All right, Best thanks, of luck. Douglas. We'll